In our last lesson, we carefully looked at the final close encounter that Jesus had with an individual before his death, and that was Pilate. If you think about it, he's kind of the last person that Jesus has interaction with at any level before he dies. Interesting that the four authors of the gospel each reconstruct the time Jesus spends with Pilate and they each give an account of the Lord's appearances before the Roman governor, how important it was. Now this was the only other Roman person that Jesus comes into contact with. The other one was the centurion, but there are no other Roman officials that he comes in contact with. And we can see in his kind of meeting with them the clash of the two cultures, Jewish and Roman. You can see the clash of cultures and beliefs in the two exchanges. One, of course, the centurion, a man of great faith, and of course, Pilate, the man who would not believe, even with the Lord in front of him. So in the end, we see that Pilate is a victim of his own pride, disbelief, thirst for power, as he's actually outmaneuvered by the Jewish leaders and the Jewish crowd. They outmaneuver him uh, and uh, as a result he sends Jesus, a person that he knew to be innocent. He tried three times to set him free. He knew he was innocent. Nevertheless, he bowed to the pressure and sent him to his death. But the illegal hearings by the Jews, the trials with Pilate, they do allow Jesus one more chance to witness his divinity before both. Jewish and Roman leadership and supply the reason for their own condemnation in the end. Think about this for a second. It was they who were on trial. I know Jesus was the one you know, in the situation being judged, but in reality they were the ones who were on trial. They were the ones who were being judged by God as the choice to believe or not to believe was presented before them and they convicted themselves by not believing. And as a result, they sent the Savior to His death. So you know, the shoe was really on the other foot. They're the ones that were being judged. It's ironically sad that their disbelief and consequential actions produced the event, which is Christ's death, that would ultimately and forevermore save the people who would believe. I mean, how ironic is that? An example of God's divine economy at working, producing a profit from a loss. In our society, you rarely produce a profit from a loss, but here it seems like a loss, but it's actually a profit for all those subsequently who would believe in Jesus. All right, so let's move on to the, the death and the burial, chapter 19. Now John's account primarily focuses on the interaction between Jesus, the Jewish leaders, and the Roman governor Pilate. That's really the focus of his, uh, of his uh, record. Uh, his purpose, of course, is to profile the belief and the disbelief expressed before Jesus' witnesses. He does not, therefore, spend a whole lot of time describing the torture and the death and crucifixion, so on and so forth. He doesn't really spend a lot of time talking about that. His description of the death of Jesus in verse 30 is given as yet another way to support Jesus' claim of divinity. So we read in verse 30, therefore when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, verse 30. So in this verse, John claims three things with the death of Christ. First, the culmination of many things. It's finished, he said. What does he mean by it's finished? Well, the prophecies about his life and work, they're done. The purpose for all that he did was deliberate and it was planned out. It was planned for him to get to this, to this moment. Uh, you know, his crucifixion was not a fluke. It was not a bad turn of events. It was not a you know, it was not, uh oh, wow, things have gone terribly wrong. They've crucified him instead of accepted him. No, -uh, that was the plan. God knew all along, Jesus knew all along that this would be the end. It was the goal and all that was supposed to precede it had been completed. Number two, it was a success. It was a, it's finished and it's also a success. All things were completed in the way that God had wanted them to be done. Jesus had told His disciples beforehand 
that this was the reason he had come and not to die would have been a failure. When, Paul, when Peter suggested, oh no, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. They're not going to take you away and kill you. Are you kidding me? We'll stop that. What, what does Jesus say? Get, get thee behind me, Satan. I came for this purpose, he said. His death, although ugly and humiliating and painful, was the successful end to the life that he was sent to live. And then thirdly, his death and the fact that it is finished signifies that he was still in control. How, you say? How is he in control? Well, he gave up his spirit. You know, I said last week that since he had no sin, no matter how bloodied and bruised he was, no one could take his soul from his body. Jesus himself releases his soul from his body to show that he submitted to death for our sakes. But he was not a slave to death like we are. We're a slave to death. It's going to happen to us. Our life is going to be taken away from us. That's not the way it was with him. He said, it's finished, now I give up my spirit. And so after this uh, brief description of Jesus' moment of death at the cross, John goes on to a more detailed description of his burial. Interesting, he spends more time talking about the burial than the actual death itself. So we read, beginning in verse 31, then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other who was crucified with him. Uh, but coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Um, the Romans normally, when they crucified somebody and they crucified you know, thousands and thousands of people, uh, they left the body on the cross and they left it there to rot. It would be there for weeks you know, until the flesh was falling off. And the whole idea was this was a warning to anyone who you know, challenge their power and challenge their law. You know, every time you walk by, that crucified, rotting body reminded you of their power. But the Jewish law required those executed to be removed before sundown as to not pollute the land. And the Romans, especially Tiberius, the, the emperor, respected Jewish religious law because they knew that if they violated that law, the Jews would rebel. The Jews would cause problems, and so in order to accommodate them, they cooperated with many of the Jewish uh, legal requirements as far as ceremony and so on and so forth, high days and you know, pilgrimages uh, going to Jerusalem. So the Romans cooperated with that. It was a kind of a, uh, you know, an uneasy truce that they had. The, 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 the Romans allowed them you know, much of uh, what their uh, you know, religious law required, and in return the Jews you know, kept the rioting and the insurrection down to a minimum and everybody kind of got along. So the Romans, as I say, normally left their victims to rot on their execution crosses uh, as a visual reminder of their brutality. The Jewish leaders asked Pilate to accommodate them in speeding up the death process by breaking the legs of the victims so that they can be removed. And of course, breaking their legs, the way you died I mean, if you didn't have a heart attack or something from the pain, the way you actually died, the cause of death in crucifixion was asphyxiation. You choked to death, you, know, you, uh, you couldn't breathe anymore. And, and the idea was you kept pushing yourself up on your legs, you know, pushing up so you could breathe, but then in doing that, the nails in your feet and would, would hurt, and so you'd go down some more, then you'd start to choke again, then you'd push up again. So that was the, that was the slow death. You were, you were choking to death, okay? And so by breaking the legs, well, it would you know, speed up death. They couldn't push themselves up, so they'd go down, they'd finally choke to death, and that would be the end of that. So they were on the eve of the Passover, and they couldn't begin their preparations before the bodies were out of sight of the general population. Of course, they were just outside of the city walls, so the pilgrims were there, too many people around. They wanted the bodies taken down. So Pilate quickly agrees, you know, he wants this matter over. Let's get, you know, let's get past this. So let's get the bodies down, let's get these guys buried, and we'll move on from all this ugly business. The orders are passed on, 
and the two other criminals have their legs broken, but as we already know, Jesus is dead, and so the soldiers don't bother breaking any of his legs. Instead, to assure themselves of his death, they pierce him with a spear, and John notes that blood and water came out of his side. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of articles, so on and so forth. A lot has been written about the medical or the symbolic nature of this blood and of this water. I'm not going to go into that. Um, this may be interesting discussion, but John, let's remember, John notes in his book that the significance of these events, that they pierced him and water and blood came out, lay in the fact that these things happened as a fulfillment of scripture. That's the important part about being pierced. Not that the blood represents something in the water and medically this means this, the heart had burst and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's interesting. But John doesn't, you know, the, only, the interesting part for John is the scripture said that he would be pierced. And so with the piercing of him, another scripture is fulfilled. So let's go to uh, verse 35, 37. He says, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So John repeats the theme of his book, that the events that have taken place, even those events taking place concerning the mutilation of his lifeless body, are a source of witness for faith. In other words, even when he's dead, even when they're sticking things into his dead body, even that can be used as a witness for faith because even that mutilation is spoken about by the prophets. So in this case, the spearing of his bones and the piercing of his side, a fulfillment of prophecy concerning the Messiah and the treatment of, uh, that he would have at the hands of others. Exodus 12, 46, Zechariah 12, uh, 12 verse 10. Uh, to name two. And all of this made even more unusual because the soldiers actually disobeyed a direct order from the governor in not breaking in his legs. Do you ever think about that? Pilate said, go break their legs. And they broke the legs of the, the other two guys and when they saw he was dead, instead of just breaking his legs, they pierced him. So they disobeyed a direct command from the governor and you know, pierced them an easier way, maybe it was too hard to break legs, who knows? And in doing so, they fulfill uh, God's plan and God's prophecy. So John points to this as yet another witness of God's divine act in sending Jesus. So after this gruesome event, or these gruesome events at the cross, John, he switches scenes and he introduces the characters uh, that bury the Lord. So we go to, um, Verse 38 says, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea was part of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, we know that from Luke uh, 23. But uh, he was opposed to their actions and he was one of the secret believers. Now prisoners who were executed, when they were finally taken down from the cross, they were thrown into a common felon's grave. In other words, a criminal, criminal's grave. Criminals were just all thrown into the same pit, no burial. Now the Romans, on occasions, would allow the families of prisoners to bury them if they made the request. But here's an interesting thing. No such request was made by Jesus' family. Not one of his brothers came to ask for the body. And yet it was tradition, you know, they, the Romans permitted the families to take the bodies and, and bury them. Yet his family did not come and ask. Same thing with his brothers and sisters. They weren't at the cross. And so when Jesus you know, gives you know, John you know, to, to take care of his mother. Some people say, well, why did he give to John? Well, you know, none of the brothers came forward to, to say, I'll take mom with me. But John was there. Okay. So anyways, Joseph sets aside his fear and he goes to Pilate to get the body. 
and think now about Joseph of Arimathea, the, uh, the secret disciple. You think this could be kept secret for a very long, that, Jesus, uh, that Joseph would be the one who went and got Jesus' body down from the cross? You think he could keep that secret? I don't think so. So even you know, Joseph now, he's stepping up. I mean, Jesus died. It would have been a lot easier you know, to forget about it. I mean, the one who asked him to believe is dead. So you'd think, well, you know, hey, no harm, no foul. I was a secret believer. I did my best. He's dead now. Well, let's just, let's move along, shall we? But no. Notice, notice that how strong his faith is. He goes and claims the dead body and in doing so reveals himself as a believer. So this action on Joseph's part also fulfills another prophecy about Jesus that he would be buried with the rich, Isaiah 53, 9. I mean, he dies as a criminal in Roman eyes and should theoretically be thrown into the common grave with the criminals. But there's a prophecy that says that the Messiah will be buried in a rich man's tomb. Well, how's that going to happen? Well, Joseph steps forward. He's a rich man. As a leader in Israel, he was wealthy. And by placing him in his own tomb, Jesus was buried in a rich man's grave and not a poor criminal's common grave. So we also see the cycle of faith turning again as Joseph, one of the Jewish leaders, breaking with his fellow Jews to express his faith in Christ. Even after he's dead, the cycle of faith continues. The brothers, his brothers, who should have been there to take his body, they demonstrate their disbelief. Joseph of Arimathea, the secret disciple who reveals himself by getting the body, he shows his belief. That same cycle keeps going round and round through all these chapters. So this was great faith indeed because the Lord is now dead. As I said, it would have been easier to just you know, forget about it and keep on going. All right, verse 39. It says Nicodemus, here's the other character for the burial. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. So Nicodemus, also a member of the Sanhedrin, also a secret disciple. He also screws up his courage and he steps forward along with Joseph to provide the spices for the burial. So Joseph, you know, he brought the linen wraps and Nicodemus brought the spices which suggest they knew and agreed on each other's participation. The weight of the spices, the position of the barriers and the quality of the grave shows that Jesus actually had a king's burial 100 pounds of spices and so on and so forth, and the wraps and being buried in a rich man, that's a king's burial. Okay? That a common person, even, even someone who wasn't a criminal, a common person wouldn't have this kind of burial. So verse 40, we keep going with the burial. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore because of the Jewish day of preparation since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So uh, Joseph and Nicodemus uh, received the body from the Romans. They bring it to Joseph's family burial place located in a garden that's nearby. Now burial places in those days were carved out of hillsides or caves unlike today where we dig down into the ground and we lower people into the ground. In those days they didn't do that. They, they had lots of caves and hillsides, a hilly country, so they just carved you know, a hole in the cave and dug out the inside of the cave and, and put you know, um, uh, tables or uh, um, what's the word, shelving if you wish, not out of wood of course, but stone shelving to lay the bodies there. Uh, it was a new tomb where the rock was carved out to produce a chamber on the side of the hill. Usually um, a rich man's um, tomb, uh, would al they'd also carve a mantle and door facades on the top of the si uh, sides. You know, they kind of frame it. You know, they dig the hole in the side of the, the hill or the cave or whatever and then they'd put you know, stone columns on the side and a, and a mantle at the top you know, to give the facade some uh, you know, better look, if you wish. Um, 
A round stone like a, like a wheel was carved and placed before the entrance to the tomb. Normally they'd put the body in, they'd wrap it up in linen and spices, they didn't embalm them. Uh, the Egyptians did that, but the Jews didn't. They just cleaned the body, wrapped it up, put it in the, in the tomb. And then after a couple of years, because it was a family tomb, after a couple of years when the skin had dried up and you know, there was, it was all bones, they'd go back into the tomb, they'd take the bones and break them up and put them into a smaller box called an ossuary and the bones would be placed in that for convenience sake because it was a family tomb and everybody was buried in there. So this was to save space. So after a couple of years, they'd put the box in there. There's grandpa, there, you know, grandma, and so, on and, and so on and so forth. So it was too late in the day, as uh, John writes, to complete the burial process, you know, to perfume the body and so on and so forth. So they lay the body in the tomb and intend to come back and finish after the Sabbath. And so Jesus, even with His lifeless body, evokes a response for those who come near Him to believe or to disbelieve. This um, image I'm showing you, this is an image of the, um, one of the pilgrim stops in Israel that claims to be the place where Jesus was buried. You know, there's a church near there. Uh, of course, uh, you, there's no way to, uh, you know, there's no plaque that says that, just from tradition. Uh, many feel this is the place. All right, so we move on to the resurrection. None of the gospel writers describe the actual resurrection because there are no witnesses. No witnesses to the resurrection. Jesus was quickened from the dead and silently left the tomb through its walls in His resurrection state. Now Matthew talks about an earthquake and an angel rolling away the stone, but this is after the fact and done to witness the fact that the deed was complete. John spends a little time describing the scene and he focuses on the reaction of the women and their witness to the apostles and then the apostles' reaction to the empty tomb. So we move on to chapter 20 and we begin reading verse one and two. It says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So um, Joseph and Nicodemus were probably coming later in the day to prepare the body, but the women, among whom Mary Magdalene was, you know, she was with them, uh, they came at dawn. They came at dawn. Now there were several women, but John focuses on the experience of only one. So some people say, how come? You know, in one they talk about a lot of women, and in this one they talk about just one. Well, he focuses on just one. Doesn't mean the others weren't there, but his description is just the experience of one of those people. All right? By this time, Jesus has risen, the earthquake has rumbled, the angel has rolled the stone away, the soldiers guarding the place have run away in fear. So the, the women note the empty tomb and Mary Magdalene goes to tell the apostles that somebody's taken away the Lord's body. You see, she, she doesn't say He's risen. She says somebody came and took the body. As far as she knows, that's what's happened so far. And so in verse three, it says, so Peter, and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again to their own homes. So Peter and John rushed to the tomb to verify what Mary has said. And Peter, you know, he gets there last, but he enters first. And what he sees are two signs of the resurrection first, the wrappings are laying there exactly as they had been placed around the body. Now, if the body would have been stolen, then the wrappings would have been kept or simply stripped off. And you know, if you're going to go steal a body that's wrapped in linen, do you, do you bother unwrapping the linen? No, you just grab the body and you go, right? But the way John describes it, 
the wrappings form an empty shell just as someone passed through them. Okay? It's not that the wrappings are unwrapped and lying in a spool, it's that the, the outline of the body is there, but it's as if the body just went right through the, right through the wrappings. And then the handkerchief, normally placed over the face, was not taken, not even thrown down, but it was carefully folded and put purposefully in another part of the corner. All done purposefully. So note that what John is describing here is his and Peter's coming to faith, but in an after the fact way. You know, he says, and they believed, which means they weren't believing before they showed up here. They both knew, but did not grasp or understand the scriptures that said that the Messiah rise from the dead, Psalm 16, 10. You know how that works. You know, today, today we say, they finally got it, or the light went on, or you know, there are a different way of saying, finally they, oh, you mean, oh, oh, wait a minute, when you said you were going to rise from the dead, you didn't mean like at the end of the world, or you didn't mean like you'd, you know, we'd hear voices, you mean your body would actually come back to life. Oh, now we get it. That's what John's trying to convey here. They had both knowledge, uh, uh, they had both rather acknowledged their faith in Him as the Messiah, but with the crucifixion their faith had waned even though the scriptures and the Lord had said he had to die, you see, <clears throat> not only did they not believe he would resurrect, they, for a longest time, didn't believe that he had to die. They were not accepting, they were in denial. So when he really did die, I mean, their faith just collapsed. But now, with the evidence of the resurrection in front of them, they realized that all of it was true and that their faith had been so small. You know, have you ever done this? You're driving you know, with your wife, and I'm talking to you guys, you're driving with your wife, you know, and you're saying, where's that turn off? You know, they said the turn off was two miles from the, from the highway. You know, we must have been two miles. You know, and, she says, and she says, well, just be patient. I think it's up there. You know, nah, you know, are you kidding? We, we've gone three miles at least. You know, and you're carping and complaining. And then all of a sudden, oh, 50th Street. Oh, well, there it is. You know, and you say to yourself, I should have, you know, I should have just kept going and just, you know. Two more minutes, we would have been there. You know? And I see by the look on your faces, it's a common experience. So I, uh, I've been there. So, you know, so they're saying to themselves, I should have believed more. I should have just accepted it for what he had said. So John explicitly says that he saw and he believed, placing himself in the company of Thomas. You know, we're always saying, oh, Thomas, he's the bad guy, but they were all like that. That he and Peter part company without joy, without enthusiasm, and they return to their own homes shows that they are stunned into silence by the event and their own personal failure to remain believing throughout the entire ordeal. Yeah, they see that he's resurrected and so on and so forth. It doesn't bring them any joy. You know, it's like, oh man, what do we do now? I mean, if it was me, I would have think, well, I guess he's not even going to bother with me now. He told me for three years that I should believe in him. He told me he was going to resurrect and I didn't believe it. I ran away. I denied him. He's probably, you know, maybe the other guys will continue with him, but he certainly doesn't want me now. That's the kind of feeling I'm, I'm only you know, extrapolating here, but just the words that John is saying, the way he describes how they reacted, they didn't look very joyful. It's not that they were completely disbelieving like the Jews, it's that their faith, which they thought to be so strong, you know, Peter ready to die for the Lord and John ready to be at the right hand or the left hand of the Lord in his kingdom, well, once their faith was tested, you know, it was found to be lacking. They talked a good game, but when the end came, they weren't there. Their faith wasn't strong enough. So the proof of resurrection at the tomb brought this home to them and humbled them to silence as the truth of the moment finally sank in. The feeling in today's culture would probably be expressed by saying, wow, it's really true. It really is true. All right, so 1113, but Mary, another character, well, we go back to Mary, was standing outside the tomb weeping, 
And so as she wept, she stooped and looked in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at their head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. So Mary is still under the impression that someone has actually stolen the body. Peter and John have looked in, looked at each other and kind of slipped quietly away back to their own homes. She now looks into the tomb and sees the angels who she questions as they address her. She thinks they're going to help her find the corpse. So let's keep reading. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was uh, Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. So Jesus himself appears to her asking the same question as the angels and she answers in the same way. In her sorrow, she recognizes neither the nature of the angels nor the person of Jesus, whom she thinks to be the gardener or the, you know, the keeper of the garden, and she asks, maybe he might know. She's still under the impression that the body was stolen. So let's keep reading. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God, and your God, Mary Magdalene, came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that He has said these things to her. So we see Jesus break through her grief by simply calling her name, and this personal address, you know, it kind of opens her eyes to who He really is. Her response, Rabboni, which was a Galilean form of the word rabbi, Mary was also from the north, shows that she recognized Him. So Rabboni means my master or Lord and was used as a title of respect for Jewish teachers. So this response is accompanied by Mary's joyful and relieved clinging. Now this would probably be, you know, in the movie, <laughs> they, in the movie, you know, they, they, they will show you know, her clinging to him, you know, like your wife clings to you, your girlfriend, you know, hug around the neck, holding, you know, because they're, they're pursuing an, you know, another dramatic storyline. But she called him master and lord. She wouldn't, she wouldn't go and hug him around the neck. She would go hug him around the feet. She would, she would be down on her knees with her arms around his legs and his feet, uh, which would be the proper position for someone who saw him as her lord and as uh, her master. Um, so, uh, she thought he was gone, but he was there alive, so she clings to him in relief. She doesn't want to lose him again. So many see Jesus' response as harsh or impatient when it's actually one of encouragement and revelation. Jesus is reassuring her that she won't lose him. There is no need to cling to him. Don't, you know, it's like, don't worry, you're not going to lose me. You can let go, it's fine. As a matter of fact, he'll be much closer to her in the future than he ever was, because why? Because when he sends the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will indwell her and comfort her. He tells her that he has not yet ascended to the Father. He will not leave her right away. She will see him again. She can let go. Now she needs to compose herself and go tell his brethren. That's significant, his brethren. A word of encouragement to the apostles who must be feeling pretty bad about their small and failing faith. Think of it now. She goes and sees them and she says, Jesus said that He's going to see you, His brethren. And could you see what Peter responds and John say? Did He really say His brethren? Did He really call us His brethren? And not Go tell those low living, disbelieving, cowardly, runaway, no good for nothing disciples of mine that I'm going to meet them in Galilee and when I get there, man, there's going to be a whooping, <laughs> right? No, he says, go tell my brethren that I go before them to Galilee. Go tell the brothers that I'm going to see him. And I could just see him say, he called us brethren? You know, whoa, there's, there's some light there. There's some encouragement there. So she's to tell them that they may have missed the resurrection, 
but if they come to Him, they will witness the last step of His earthly ministry, and that will be His visible bodily ascension into heaven. So people say, yeah, but the apostles, you know, they didn't see the resurrection. No, but they did see the ascension, and they did witness that. So John recounts that Mary followed the Lord's instructions and sought out the apostles to announce to them the good news of the resurrection. And in this we see, among others, two interesting points. One, God gives the privilege of seeing and announcing the resurrection to a woman, which was a high honor and indication of His love for women. You know, when, I, when I hear people you know, blaming Christianity for the disrespect to women, or for the oppression of women, my first thought is, oh, okay, whoever's saying this has never read the New Testament, doesn't really know the Bible. Imagine, his own apostles, hand-picked apostles that he sent out to do miracles and so on and so forth, he could have just as easily appeared to them. They went to the tomb, but he didn't. He appeared to Mary. Very significant idea. And the second thing, is we see another example of the cycle of miracle and belief. Mary looked at the angels and didn't recognize them. She looked at Jesus and didn't recognize or believe her eyes at first, but when He called her name, she finally believed what was before her. Well, you know what? Today, through the word, many see the miracles of resurrection and Jesus calls many by name through the gospel to believe but not all respond with faith to the risen Jesus like Mary did. You know, we say, wouldn't it be great you know, if, if Jesus, you know, like Matthew, He said to Matthew, you come, follow me, and He said to Peter, you, know, you Peter and John, you guys, you come, follow me. Well, He says the same thing. You know, when Alan heard the gospel, well, Jesus was saying to Alan, Alan, you, you come and follow me. Patty, you come and follow me. And you know, Ron, you come and follow me. And, Jim, you, well, maybe not Jim, but I'm <laughs> ah, just kidding. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's personal. When we hear the gospel, when we hear the gospel, right, it's personal. If we hear the gospel, we're, we're calling, Jesus is calling individuals, as it were, by name, to come and to follow Him. So Mary did, and she was blessed for it. All right, so next week we move on to Jesus' appearances to the uh, apostles themselves. We're getting close to the end here, almost to the end of our series. So thank you for your attention. Keep on going next time.